You know, another question people ask is, you know, when you go to the egg section of the grocery store, there's so many different things like, you know, how are the chickens raised? What are they fed? Right. What, what do you suggest when you were saying, you know, a couple of hard boiled eggs? Is there anything that we need to be looking for with the eggs? Yeah, I think it's important for people to understand that free range doesn't necessarily mean that the chickens are out in this pasture roaming freely. Um, actually, <laughs> they can put that on the on the carton and, and all that really needs to be uh, to the criteria that's required for that is that there be a little door that the chickens can walk out of um, into the sunshine. Now, you know, majority of the time they're just staying put. So we really want eggs that are from pasture raised hens. Um, obviously the, the, the food, just like the food that we eat is so important. What we're eating, we wanna make sure that they're eating the right things too. So, um, so organic is always a great way to go. Trying to get soy free eggs. A lot of the, the feeds that chicken are, chickens are fed or have soy in them. So if you can get soy free, that's great. Um, yeah. And what are you I, concerned about with the soy? So soy is, it can actually interfere with thyroid function. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it, majority of it in this country is genetically modified. Um, mm. It is what we call a phytoestrogen. So it can act like estrogen in the body. And so, you know, sometimes we, <laughs> we don't want too much estrogen. So yep. that's an important consideration. And, you know, the way I think of it is there's like natural estradiol that's in us that is, that is good. Uh, and we also want to, um, you know, as we get older, our estrogen as women, right, declines. Um, but we want to make sure that we aren't getting too much from other areas. So it's really about uh, moderation. Okay, Deanna. So I've always been curious, you know, uh, when you look on the side of a package to look at the ingredients and in the ingredients list at the end, it just says, you know, natural flavors. What is that? So natural flavors are not really all that natural. They're extracted from plant and animal sources, which is why they get to be called natural. Uh, they're used to enhance the flavor of foods, but they're highly processed and they can contain more than hundred different chemicals, um, preservatives, solvents, other substances that we really don't wanna be eating and putting in our bodies. The other thing is that they're not required to list on the packaging, the source of that um, flavoring. So it can be from genetically modified crops. Again, things that we really don't wanna be putting in our bodies, corn, soy, sugar beets. Oh, wow. Okay, so as long as it starts with something that's extracted from a plant or an animal source, um, they can put all sorts of other things in it. And that's the danger. It, it can all be like hidden in natural flavors. Exactly. Okay. Well, a big question people have, right, is around sugar. So let's talk about sugar, sugar substitutes. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts there? Like, does Manuka honey help with immunity? What do you think of agave, right? Um, are monk fruit, fruit drops okay? Do you like stevia? Like, what would you recommend? Well, first, I'm going to say just out of the gate that sugar is very pro-inflammatory. And our ancestors used to eat about 20 teaspoons a year. We eat mm. about 20 teaspoons a day or more. Huh. So, you know, that kind of gives you some perspective on you know, this sugar epidemic and how it's really um, responsible for a lot of the chronic disease that we're seeing. So of course, you know, we're always looking for alternatives. And, um, you know, I love natural sweeteners like honey and maple syrup, I think honey, has, you know, the Manuka honey is great for immune health. Um, again, I think you wanna use these things sparingly. I mean, if you're sick and you have a cold and you wanna have some hot tea with honey, you know, by all means, I think it's a great thing to do or to sweeten something. Um, but I, I think the other thing to understand is that as long as we continue to eat sweet, we're always gonna crave sweet. So whether it's natural sugars or artificial sugars, our body doesn't know the difference, okay? <laughs> So in terms of the alternatives, monk fruit, fruit, I think is a great option. Stevia, a lot of people don't like the taste. So that, that can be you know, a, a problem in, in that. Um, there's uh, sugar alcohols like erythritol and xylitol. 
And uh, again, nice options. Uh, if you use them a lot, they can actually cause loose stools and the amount that can cause that can vary for the individual. So again, use sparingly. And then agave, which used to be extremely popular, <clears throat> um, you know, as a healthy alternative, we now, it's really the least healthy option for us because of how it's processed and the fact that it contains 56% fructose. All right. So what you just got me thinking about is that in cooking, it's really good to use grade B maple syrup if you have to sweeten something. And I was also thinking about how many people are on diet sodas, diet whatever, right? And and how damaging really is the way that diet sodas are sweetened? Well, it's really interesting because these artificial sweeteners like aspartame uh, were banned um, from use for many years. And somehow, some way, someone was able to get it into our food. And, um, you know, they, they actually are neurotoxins. And so they can cause all kinds of, you know, issues like headaches and anxiety and depression. So they really, you know, they really are damaging to the brain and we want to avoid them as much as possible. They're in gum, in almost every type of gum you can find, which is, again, wow. one of those things that a lot of people chew. And so finding natural sources of gum, there's Simply Gum, which is great. Um, there's there's uh, you know some other really good sources that have xylitol as their base, their sugar base. All right, well, why don't we, you know, people kind of get overwhelmed when they're shopping and if we ask them to read labels, et cetera. And so can you please uh, just kind of break it down, make it simple. What am I looking for when I'm reading a label and what's the most important pieces I should be paying attention to? Yeah. So for me, it's serving size and then sugar content. Those are like the two things that I really look at. So again, as I was really, you know, talking about with Snapple, you think it's one bottle is, is one serving size, but when you actually look at it, it's two. So you're not, you're getting double the amount of sugar that's in that Snapple. So that's really important. And then, you know, we wanna look at the macronutrient content. So the amount of carbs, proteins, and fats. And ideally we want sort of a, you know, similar numbers in all of those areas um, as opposed to very high carbohydrate, right? So just like we want a balanced meal, we want, anything that we're you know, buying packaged to be, be more balanced with regard to those macronutrients. And then less important, I think for people, um, but some people are paying attention to these things, the micronutrient content. So that's the vitamins and minerals. And, um, and then the ingredient list obviously is really important. And I might even move that up to the, to the top of my list with the serving size and sugar, because obviously they're, are lots of things in there. If you can't pronounce the word, you probably don't want to be putting that in your body. Um, again, the high sugar piece is, um, is really important. So lots of ingredients probably don't want to be putting it. So smaller number of ingredients, lower sugar, um, obviously, and then a nice balance of protein, fat, and carb, I think is really the way to go when it comes to looking at packaged foods. And I love uh, for cereals, uh, you had told me to make sure I have more fiber than I do grams of sugar in, in a cereal if I was going to be buying it. So I like that little fun fact. Um, what about any advice that you have around um, like sprouted Ezekiel bread or, you know, we're, we're, I understand that we should stay away from you know, carbs as much as possible. Um, but if someone wanted to go gluten-free and they want a good bread, what do you think? Also, Ezekiel is a sprouted, is from sprouted grains. So people will sometimes digest that easier. It is mm. not a gluten-free bread. So, um, you know, again, mm. I think the statistic is one in three people now have um, non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So, you know, I think looking at gluten again, I'm going to, I'm going to 
tell you to try and stay away from processed foods as much as possible. I always say, if I could wave a magic wand over my patients and have them eat the most health promoting food, promoting food, it would be food that comes directly from nature. So we're talking about bread, it's a processed food. Do I want you eating that? Not really, especially if you have a lot of health challenges, right? So, I mean, there are gluten-free options like Canyon, Canyon Bakehouse, uh, my husband loves. Uh, Udi's, there's some other options out there for gluten-free breads. But again, I, I'm going to encourage you to kind of have those more sparingly. And it's a carb load. What, because what? It's a carb load. Hmm. So is this the similar reason why steel cut oats are better than old fashioned uh, processed oats? So, you know, it's interesting. Um, so Oats in their natural form are a groat. They look like a little tiny piece of rice. So mm. steel cut is they take the groat and they just take a steel knife, steel knife, and they cut it. So minimally processed, right? So when it's minimally processed, it has less of a spike in blood sugar. Rolled oats, on the other hand, they steam, they roll, and then you have your oats. So more processing, more spike in blood sugar. And then the instant oats, they take that even further in the sense that they steam them longer, uh, roll them thinner and cut them into smaller pieces. And again, so higher spike in blood sugar with the, uh, the instant oats. Wow. And can you talk a little bit about uh, lectins? So, you know, we all have defense mechanisms to keep us alive and plants have these as well. Some plants use lectins as their form of defense. And the way to identify these vegetables are that they have skins and um, seeds in them. So the problem with le lectins is that they resist being broken down in the gut. They can bind to the gut wall. They can interfere with digestion, absorption of vitamins and minerals, especially calcium, iron, phosphorus, and zinc. Um, they can also affect the growth and action of our intestinal flora. So they really can contribute to a lot of digest digestive issues for many people. And because they bind to the gut wall so tightly, they can actually cause autoimmune disease. So, <clears throat> you know, if you have an autoimmune condition, it's definitely worth trying to get off lectins. I remember the first lecture that I went to on this and I was saying to myself when I heard it, oh my gosh, these are why some of my patients aren't getting better. And mm. so, you know, I went back with this information and said, okay, let's try a lectin-free diet. Let's see how you do. And a lot of times, you know, patients did really well with that. How would you tell people to support their liver to, to one thing would be to have less toxins and give it less to do, right? Not, not eat uh, high fructose fruits that often, but you know, certainly they can eat them once in a while. Um, what else would you tell them would help support their liver? Well, I think, you know, in terms of just looking at personal care products, making sure that they're not laden with chemicals. There's a, a wonderful organization called the Environmental Working Group, www.ewg.org, where you can go and look at your personal care products, see how clean or toxic they are. They also have great recommendations. You can even go on Amazon and put in EWG verified shampoo, for example, and um, mm. some sh shampoos will come up that, you know, they have already verified. So I think that's a great way. I think also looking at the air that we breathe, the water we're drinking, obviously we're talking a lot about processed foods, getting those processed foods out. All of those things tax the liver. So, um, you know, plastics are huge, a huge, huge problem. Um, yeah. And, you know, getting back to the whole soy estrogen thing, plastics also are what we call xenoestrogens. So, you know, we see a lot of men with man boobs. And why is that? <laughs> because they're getting too much, much estrogen in their food, mm. in their personal care products, cleaning products that they're, you know, exposed to all these different things are raising levels of estrogen in men and causing these problems. Wow. So I want to know, I, you know, pretty consistently have stayed around 135, 140 pounds in my life. But now, even though that is where my weight is, sometimes I fluctuate to 145. But 
I've kind of been in that 10 pound range a majority of my life. But now, even though I'm still in that same range, why am I having trouble losing weight? Like my normal tactics that worked for quite a while in my life don't seem like they're working as much anymore. So I'm trying to trying to understand with the same amount of movement and same amount of food, why it feels like my body's changing or something's changed. Yeah, I think, you know, as we age and depending on this, again, the state of your health, um, the body kind of puts weight loss on the back burner and says, listen, I need to prioritize my energy for things like healing, repair, detoxification, fighting infection, cellular house cleaning. So our, our cells clean house every day and they need energy to do that. So all of these things are sort of more important for the body. The body's all about survival, right? So weight loss is like, oh, no, sorry. <laughs> so, and I think the other thing is um, for women in particular, I remember when I hit menopause, again, sort of exactly what you're talking about. Same diet, same ever exercise, 10 pounds instantly gained. And I was like, oh my gosh, what is going on? And so I ended up doing some rebalancing of my hormones. And that really helped me to um, lose the weight that I had gained. And I think, again, we sort of talked about carbs and I realized that my body just wasn't able to handle them and manage them the way that I could when I was younger. So taking that down, um, you know, to a lower level is also what allowed me to lose that weight. And I think, you know, also something I'm a little bit guilty of is gaining and losing weight. Like I stay within that 10, 15 pound range. Um, but when I do, and when I'm losing weight, right, I'm losing half muscle, half fat. When I'm gaining weight, I'm gaining all fat, um, unless I'm, you know, extra working out at the gym. Um, and so over time, uh, fat burns a lot less seven times. I think uh, muscle burns seven times more at rest than fat does. And so that might be contributing as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, as we age, our, our muscle loss, you know, just declines. I mean, it's gradual, but it does decline. And so that's why it's really important to have some sort of exercise program that, you know, taxes the muscles so that you're, you're not necessarily building, but maintaining muscle mass. Muscle mass is so important. Yeah. And yeah. So I think it's, 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 and I think our diets are also a huge contributor. Um, you know, when it comes to protein, I just don't think that we're getting in enough, even yeah. if we're eating animal protein, I don't think we're, we're getting in enough. And um, so that ability to maintain that, that muscle mass you know, with diet and with exercise is it just becomes harder to do as we age. So we need to be that much more diligent about these things. So it's really about the body prioritizing what it's going to focus on, right? Uh, hormones, our age and muscle loss and what we're putting in our body. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about water quality. What do you, what's important about it? What should people be thinking about? So I would say natural spring water or filtered water. You know, there's so many impurities in our water today. So, you know, the biggie is chlorine, which wipes out the intestinal flora, which we need for so many things, our immune health, creating certain vitamins. Um, so yeah, so I would say if you're going to have tap water, either avoid it or filter it. Um, if you get bottled water, I would say best in glass. So you don't, if you're getting plastic uh, water in plastic bottles, you, there's a risk of those microplastics leaching into the water that you're drinking. And now so, you've got your liver is going to have more work to do. Exactly. Got it. And so who cares about water? Why, why do we even need to drink so much of it every day? <laughs> well, your body is 70% water. Um, mm -hmm. We need it to keep cells hydrated and functioning properly. It's essential to get rid of waste. Um, so it also helps with nutrient absorption, uh, blood circulation, boosts energy, great for brain health. Um, so that's why it's really, really important. And, you know, my recommendation is usually to try and get in about half your body weight in ounces of water. So let's say you weigh 150 pounds, you want to get in about 75 ounces of water per day. 
as you sip on your. I know. I just thought I'd put this in. I don't know. I got it for the holidays, but uh, it's a stainless steel uh, water bottle that keeps it insulated. And it also lights up and reminds me throughout the day to drink. And I find if I like the color and it kind of, you know, surprises me, I pay attention when it turns, I just grab and I drink it. So I think there's ways that we can. Uh, and I also have an app on my phone that allows me in a social group to kind of stay accountable with a group of us. So you're competing to stay hydrated. Like who can argue with that? Right. So mine is called hydrate spark. That's one of them. I, I don't know. There must be many of them out there, but, um, but I like it. And so just when you were talking about it, I thought, Oh, I haven't had a sip in a while. <laughs> really? Yeah. So let's do a little, uh, endocrine talk here. So is it normal? that is it just normal like is it inevitable that as we get older we're going to have an endocrine disorder like a thyroid problem or something like that yeah it's not normal i think it's become normal because it's so prevalent in our society and again that's because of all the chemicals we're exposed to um you know all of the the things that i mentioned food water um personal care products cleaning products plastics um, you know, they've dumped, I think it's something like 80,000 new chemicals into our, you know, products that we use um, since the 1950s. And, you know, none of them has been studied separately as to how they um, affect the body. And then when we've got a bunch of them, you know, together, <clears throat> what's the effect of that? And again, I think it's going to be, you know, it really does depend on each person's state of health. That's why it's really hard to say, oh, you know, this is right for everybody because, you know, some people that are, are healthier may be able to tolerate things that people who are really struggling with health challenges can't. All right. So while we're on the topic of endocrine, uh, you know, if someone has low thyroid, let's say they have Hashimoto's, so autoimmune low thyroid, um, and they don't want to go on synthetic hormones, like the most popular, right, is Synthroid or whatever the synthetic hormones are. If they don't want to do that, what's something that they could do? Well, I say the number one thing for anyone with any autoimmune condition is to get off gluten, 100%. So <clears throat> gliadin is the protein in gluten, and it has a similar molecular structure to the thyroid gland. So when you eat gluten, that gliadin gets into the bloodstream, the immune system tags it as something foreign and says, okay, I need to get this out of the body. It attacks it. And at the same time, it attacks the thyroid tissue as well. This is what we call molecular mimicry. So the more you eat gluten, the more it's going to worsen your symptoms and worsen your thyroid condition over time. So gluten is I mean, I'm going to say an easy way <laughs> because, it, I mean, it is an easy way to help prevent your thyroid from getting, you know, especially when you have Hashimoto's and you're continuing that gluten intake, you're just constantly stressing that thyroid. So the thyroid glands being attacked by the antibodies, it um, fibrosis and scars. And then over time, you have a gland that is no longer able to function as well. So the more that you can take out the gluten, the more you're going to prevent that uh, fibrosis and scarring of the gland and then inevitable need for thyroid hormone replacement. Okay. So now I understand why I definitely ruined my thyroid gland. I'm Indian. We eat naan and bread and all these things. And I've been doing that for 20 years after being diagnosed with thyroid. So uh, I think you know, you learn it when, when you learn it and then you get off of it. Right. So Deanna, what guidelines, what are you thinking about, uh, around replacing sex hormones? So do people that are 60, 70, you know, years old, could they benefit from having hormone replacement? Absolutely. I think balancing hormones is essential to health at all stages of life. And it's really interesting when you look at the questions related to the symptoms related to hormone imbalance and see that they can be 
not just related to sex and reproduction. So um, they can determine cardiometabolic health. They can de help determine thyroid health. So everything's interconnected and interrelated with regard to the hormones. So balancing them can be really, really beneficial. And I think for both men and women in that it's just so instrumental in supporting the body with healing and improving symptoms and chronic disease. So hormone imbalance can really be one of the root causes of chronic disease. I was gonna say, I always say there are many pieces to the puzzle and it's really about putting all those pieces together when it comes to health. And I find hormone balance, imbalance is you know, one of those pieces that we need to address. And so if we are feeling off, we're not feeling quite like ourselves, or we're, you know, having that extra fatigue, or we're feeling uh, we're losing hair or dry, you know, skin, whatever it is, if we start noticing symptoms, what do you want to make sure that we ask our provider, if we ask our provider to run tests on cortisol or thyroid, um, what should we make sure is being checked? You know, I think for thyroid, it's really important. Most doc conventional doctors are going to just run a TSH. Some might run a free T4, but I think it's really important to look at both the free and total levels of T4 and T3, which is the active form of thyroid hormone, and also to do the thyroid antibody testing. Because as I mentioned, you know, if you've got this onslaught of antibodies attacking the gland over time, it's not going to function. And then you're going to need thyroid hormone replacement. So if we can intervene and say, oh, you've got these antibodies attacking your gland. Let's have you get off gluten. Let's look at certain nutrients that can help support the thyroid. Maybe we can prevent that from happening. I mean, unfortunately, the focus in conventional medicine is really not about prevention. And, you know, most docs are not going to tell you to get off gluten because they don't even really know <laughs> what it does and how, you know, how it affects the body. So, yeah, yeah so I think, you know, it's, it's a struggle. Deanna, could you give us some guidelines around what to do if someone is struggling with constipation, sleep, uh, having cramping, you know, they're not quite um, they're, they're under a lot of stress. And so now they're starting to have these symptoms. What would you be suggesting? So I love magnesium. It's what we call the relaxing mineral in the body. So it can help with constipation. Um, it can help with sleep. It can help with anything that twitches, cramps, or spasms. Um, it can help with anxiety, headaches, tension, headaches, um, stress, muscle, muscle tightness and tension. So I love magnesium. It's also great for blood pressure. And, um, you know, some people have heart arrhythmias and it, it, again, because it's relaxing, it's calming everything down. So for people who have issues with constipation, I recommend magnesium citrate. And that's because the citrate pulls the water into the bowel, making the stool softer. So it's easier to pass. And then for people who have normal bowels or looser stools, I recommend magnesium glycinate. And again, both do the same thing. It's just that I kind of use the bowels as a, a deciding factor on which one to choose. So what are some caveats uh, for probiotics? Should everyone have probiotics? What do you need to think about if you want to go on probiotics? Everything's about gut health these days and helping the microbiome. And gut health is really so important for brain health, immune health. I mean, just... Yeah, so it's really important. The problem is, is that some people have what we call dysbiosis. So they have an imbalance of gut flora. And um, what happens is sometimes if they take probiotics, it can actually make their digestive systems get symptoms, gas, bloating, reflux, heartburn worse. So it's, you know, it's probably best to, to do a stool testing with a, a healthcare provider really get an understanding of what your microbiome looks like, like what you're lacking, what you need. Do you need support with digestion, with digestive enzymes or stomach acid, like that apple cider vinegar that you alluded to earlier is great for kind of boosting stomach acid production. So again, one size fits all, not here, but I do have a lot of patients who have come to me on an over-the-counter probiotic called PB8 
So pe peanut butter eight. <laughs> um, and, you know, when I've looked at their test results being on this probiotic, their gut flora has actually looked really good. So, and it's pretty clean. I think the only inactive ingredient in it is the vegetable, the cellulose that's in the vegetable capsule. So, so it's a great, great option for people to try. I would go with lower CFUs. That's how they quantify the amount of uh, probiotic and, and just start low and go slow and see how you feel with it. If you're unable to, you know, to connect with a, a practitioner that can help you with this. Great. Well, thank you so much, Deanna. I love your, every time I talk to you, I learn so much. So thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your energy, your effort, and your passion for this work. Thank you. I am very, very passionate about food. Food is medicine. <laughs> the right kind of food is the right kind of medicine. Love it. Thanks, Deanna. You're welcome. Take care.